All right. Good morning. Let's see here. I, I think we were going to have some speakers if they were here. I don't know if they made it yet, but um, I do know we have Laura Hurt, who's the development director for Jacobs Village. And would you care to make some comments? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start first. Yeah, and then we'll have. I'll start first. Welcome to Jacobs Village. Uh, we appreciate you uh, coming down to Southern Indiana and welcome back home to Southern Indiana. We're Thank glad you. you're here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm Michelle Current, <laughs> Executive Director here at, at Jacobs Village. Um, just to, I would like to give you a little historical perspective about Jacobs Village and how we came to be. Um, some of you, I know after just speaking with you, um, we're here at the front end of Jacobs Village, but when before the buildings were even built and it was just dirt. But basically, the vision of Jacobs Village came to be in 1987 when Andy and Charmy Guagenti were blessed with a beautiful grandson named Jacob. Jacob was born with Down syndrome. And so just like any other family who has um, children with disabilities, they immediately jumped to the future and thought, what happens to my child when I can no longer take care of them? And so Andy took it upon himself to come up with a vision uh, to have a community, uh, a place where adults with disabilities could come and live and achieve and uh, aspire like all of us want to do. So in uh, 2003, the first of two supportive living homes were developed, um, two of the five that are now here, commonly known as phase one. Phase one is comprised of basically uh, three mm -hmm. men's homes and two ladies' homes. Each home has uh, four master bedrooms, so they have their own personal space, but then they have a common living area of a living area, a large kitchen where they cook together, they eat together, they play together, they have fun together as a family unit. So in 2007, our Jacobs Village Board of Directors decided that we have another underserved population in our area that needs housing assistance, that being our seniors. Um, so along with IHCDA and through your partnership and support, Jacobs Village developed what's known as Phase 2. Phase 2 is basically six uh, duplexes that equate to 12 apartments. Uh, we've got six one-bedroom apartments and six two-bedroom apartments. Um, we have seniors 55 and over that live in these apartments as well as adults with disabilities. So having said that, we've got phase one and phase two that we're very proud of. Um, again, I know some of you have been here. If you've not driven through our campus, please drive through. You'll see the beautiful homes we have here in a very gorgeous rural setting. Um, it's just a very inviting and, and very um, safe environment for our residents, seniors as well as our adults with disabilities. Now, fast forward into this building. Um, the board decided that when you have a community of 40 individuals like we have, you need to have a place where they can gather in fellowship. So this beautiful building was built in 2016, not only houses our business offices, but also this communal space. So you can imagine our residents get together. Um, Jamie Espenlob is our resident manager, and she is tasked to um, have different activities for our residents to enjoy, whether it's bingo, whether it's um, Easter egg hunts, Valentine dances, karaoke is a big deal here. <laughs> so um, as you can imagine, it's a blended, um, beautiful community, again, of our seniors and our adults with disabilities. So I'm gonna pass it off to Laura Hurt. Again, she's our Director of Development, and she's gonna give you a little more insight into Jacobs Village. But can I ask a question? You said you have phase one and two. Are there any other phases in the future? That's a great question. Um, we have 130 acres here. Um, we, we want to stay true to our mission, and that is to have a safe and walkable community for our residents to um, grow um, and aspire to be everything that they can be. So to answer your question, that's a dream. Yes, um, there's nothing in, in concrete, but it all depends on funding sources. It all depends on the infrastructure to make sure that it's, it's solid and can support that. Um, so the need is great, not only for adults with disabilities, but for our senior population, as you're aware. Um, so we've got the grounds, we've got the desire to do it, but it's in, in our, hopefully in our pipeline. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. We do talk about that quite a bit in our strategic plan, so that would be definitely be a goal. 
Um, as Michelle mentioned, I know the weather's not conducive today, but if you do get a chance just before you leave, just to do a quick drive through, we're, we're really proud of the grounds and um, it is safe, accessible, walkable. We have a nature trail back there as, as well as a meditation garden. It's just a really beautiful space to try to stay very true to the mission of uh, keeping it safe, accessible, walkable, and for our residents to form those meaningful relationships. Um, my role as development director is to keep us sustainable. So we've got a couple different funding sources. We've got, of course, our uh, corporate donors that have been longtime corporate donors as well as individual donors. We've got IHCDA, uh, which will help us with the builds, but also with those NAP credits. That's just been an amazing fundraising tool for us and has really helped us uh, establish another revenue source for us. So that's been really wonderful. Uh, we've got special events um, and then grants as well. A couple of our special events, we do a nice trivia night, which is casual and fun, a little different from the gala, um, and get a great turnout for that and get to share our mission a little bit more with folks. Uh, and then the otters are supportive of us as well, doing a, an exhibition game where 100% of the proceeds go to support Jacob's Village. Uh, just in, in closing, I, I would just say I think I've been here about seven or eight years, and we knew there was a need. We did our research when we went to put up the apartments, um, but what we, we couldn't anticipate was how the seniors would interact uh, and integrate with our people with disabilities. You know, that, that was an unknown for us. And what has happened is it's just been a really beautiful relationship. Uh, one of our di residents with disabilities uh, walks the dog of one of our senior residents. Uh, one of our seniors has really taken under, the uh, under her wings a couple of the residents with disabilities. I mean, that relationship for me has been, for all of us, I think, has mm -hmm. been really beautiful to watch grow and just very naturally and organically. And it's, uh, it's aided by really great uh, you know, programming that we have, but um, really uh, just a neat and I think unique community here. So thank you for your support of it. Thank you. Any Very questions nice. from the board? I would only ditto. Um, years ago when uh, group homes uh, taking over for institutionalization of uh, mental health yes. and, and all mm -hmm. kinds of different care, I traveled and, and helped build group homes um, as an attorney all over because of zoning issues and it was the um, it's one of the only times I've been hit, it's one of the only times I've had a gun pulled on me um, in all over rural Indiana, southern Indiana from 40 south. And, um, and people were very emotional, it was change, and they weren't accepting of it. And it was a, a strange environment to be in. And we would go in and um, we had some exemptions under Section 1983 of the Constitution, discrimination, we usually get them done, but we still were mindful of local zoning and planning. And almost a T on 20 of 25, we built exactly what you said would happen. The neighbors that had viciously opposed this, because it was change, uh, they would call six months, nine months later, I or, or the clients that were actually doing the work, and say, wow, they're walking our dog, they're, do they're taking care of this, these are our best friends. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's just people are scared of it, right. and then once the integration know. occurs, it, it makes them so happy. So, I'll just echo that. In 2002, I had the opportunity to get introduced to Jacobs Village, and uh, at the time, this was just a field. And I remember we went to Apple Patch, which yes. is in Kentucky, and we went to go look at that property and to see if there was a way that we could replicate it here in Indiana. And I remember it was just a vision, and um, we knew that there was a lot of work that had to be done to be able to do what is here today. And I'm just really so proud of the work that you're doing uh, to come back and to see um, this, this village uh, and the support uh, for the residents and the quality of life that they're living today because uh, you guys are doing great work. So I just want to thank you for that. It's been you know, since 2002 since I've been a part of this, so this is really great. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for believing in us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. And I, I believe we also have Reverend Adrian Brooks, who's the president and CEO of Memorial CDC here. Uh, Reverend Brooks, would you care to make some comments for us? <laughs> I just want to welcome you. You, of course, Lieutenant Governor, this is your neck of the woods, and we're certainly glad to have you and the board uh, present today. Um, again, thank you for all that you do for our communities and helping some of our most vulnerable families to uh, have nice places to live. Uh, we have 
Uh, uh, Brother Jacob and I go way back. I, I'm trying to think <laughs> when we first met. Um, Probably before 2002. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We we I was a little um, skinnier and had a little more hair, maybe <laughs> uh, a few gray. But uh, um, it's been a great partnership that we have enjoyed, and uh, we're we're just glad to have you and and the rest of your board, including our our uh, fellow uh, brother over here, Brother Shopmeyer, who. We've served with in this community for a long time and had some pretty interesting debates because of our friendship uh, that, that happens. Uh, but uh, uh, the work you do, uh, I, I don't think you'll ever know the impact that you have on our, our community in providing really nice, affordable uh, housing for individuals. We've been, like, like we've said, we've been doing this for, this is our 25th year. Today is our actual annual luncheon. Uh, Lieutenant Governor is going to be our speaker, and we're looking forward to hearing her insights. Uh, but for 25 years, we've been doing this work, and uh, it's been the most fulfilling work I, I think one can do in a community. Uh, but we can't do it without partners like you. And so thank you for coming to the sunny side of uh, Indiana, Evansville. <laughs> God, God bless you and your efforts. Thank you, Reverend Brooks. And I don't know if Alice Weathers is here or if uh, Commissioner Musgrave is here. Okay, great. Uh, Chief of Staff, is there a quorum? Yes, Madam Chair, there is. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm going to call to order the August 2019 meeting of the IHCDA Board of Directors. The first uh, item on our agenda is the um, approval of the minutes. But before we do that, for those we do live stream our meetings for those that perhaps are watching. If the board could go around and introduce themselves, um, that would probably be helpful for people that are watching for the first time. June? June Midkiff. Beach Grove, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> right? Fishers. Fishers, Fishers. okay. Sure. Mike Schottmeyer um, from Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Jacob Seip, Executive Director at the Indiana Housing Community Development Authority. Suzanne Crouch, Lieutenant Governor. I'm Mark Wolner, I'm Executive Director of the Indiana Bond Bank, sit in this role as designee for uh, Indiana State Treasurer Kelly Mitchell. Mark Pasquella, Indiana Finance Authority, sitting as designee for the Public Finance Director Dan Hubie. Great. So our first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes uh, from July 25th, our 2019 board meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. We will now move to, um, well, let's welcome Peter Nelson to discuss a recommendation regarding the bond volume 4% credits Friendship House. Welcome. Good morning, board. Thank you. Um, yes, I have the first two agenda items here, or the next two, I suppose. Uh, the first one is for bond volume and 4% credits for Friendship House. Um, this project is the first application we received in the 2019 bond round. It represents a total development cost of almost $27 million. And they are requesting $15 million in bond volume and $792,938 in LIHTC annually to preserve 150 units and then create an additional 24 units of affordable housing. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, uh, the Allied Real Estate Partners LLC is proposing the rehabilitation of 150 community units in West Lafayette, along with new construction of a new wing along their building, um, creating 24 new units. Uh, this project has one and two bedroom units. Uh, the vast majority of them are one bedroom uh, for senior residents. And the current 150 units are under a HAP contract. So they are receiving assistance and the new construction units will also be receiving assistance, but those project-based vouchers are coming from the city of West Lafayette, it's housing authority. Um, so all, all of the units will include some rental assistance. Uh, the, the scope of the rehab work is going to include new appliances, range hoods, um, light fixtures, just kind of a refurbishment of all of the, all of the stuff in the units. Um, it's also gonna include a new roof and upgraded accessibility and entrance ramps. 
Um, so it's going to be nice and walkable, easy for everybody to get around. Um, during the round, uh, we re reviewed these, the application, made sure it met the criteria of our 2018-2019 qualified allocation plan. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with the developer on July 15th so they could present to the real estate and executive staff for the project. Um, and we are comfortable recommending the full amount of bond volume and tax credits for this project. Thank you. Board, are there any questions for Peter? I believe we're ready for your resolution. Staff respectfully request the board approve the following resolution. Resolve that the board approve awarding $15 million in bond volume and $792,938 in annual LITEC to Friendship House Communities LLC for Friendship House according to the terms of the 2019 AB application round as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded for approval. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Peter. And I believe you now have a recommendation regarding a bond volume 4% credit for Sweet Galilee at Wigwam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is. So this application for bond volume and tax credits was the fifth application we received in the 2018 bond round. Um, it represents a total development cost of just under $30 million, requesting $19,350,000 in, $350, in bond volume and $1,029,880 in LITEC annually for 10 years to create 130 units of affordable housing. Uh, the initial application also included a request for a $500,000 affordable housing and community development fund loan. So this is an affordable assisted living facility. And just to kind of give uh, a little refresh on, on what that means is it operates similar to a normal assisted living facility working so seniors can have independent living with the addition of optional services. Now per the tax credit code, um, only the rent is covered by the, by the tax credits. So any mandatory services that are gonna be selected would be lumped in to the rent. So all of, we've, we've worked building this product and um, over the past several years of applications of th this type of product to make sure the, the optional services are truly optional. Um, the income for those services come from the Medicaid waiver, so those are paid for via that. And the residents are able to select kind of from a menu of services and the Medicaid waiver will cover, cover certain levels depending on how intensive those services are. And they can range from anything from just assistance with daily living to prescriptions to uh, physical um, support. And then we do meet with the FSSA Division of Aging to make sure that they're not only aware but supportive of these, of these types of projects. Um, so BWI LLC is proposing the new construction of a four-story, 130-unit assisted living facility in Anderson, Indiana. Um, it will provide independent living along with array of personal care and supportive services to residents age 62 and older. Um, it'll contain a fitness room, activity rooms, a library, a dining room with a commercial kitchen so they can offer offer meals, and then certified staff will be on duty 24-7, and then the development is located next to the old high school um, in, in Anderson, so it's fairly close to downtown, easily accessible, so um, not only the residents, but any other guests um, would have fairly quick access to any amenities or anything around, around Anderson. Um, so during, during the round, we reviewed, made sure it met the criteria of the 2018-2019 QAP, and the development team was able to meet with real estate and executive staffs on August 6th of this year to, to present the project to us. And then we are comfortable recommending the full amount of the bond volume, tax credits, and development fund for this project. Board, are there any questions for Peter? 
This is part of a larger development. Do I recall the BWI did something else in the wigwam or with the wigwam? Peter? They they do have another project right right there. So um, they are they're separate they're separate entities. It's not like a s another phase. This project okay. isn't another phase, but they do have a large chunk of land, so they they are able to use that and uh, benefit from the. De talent development center i don't remember exactly what they're calling it in in the actual wigwam building thank you any additional questions i think we're ready for your resolution peter excellent staff respectfully <coughs> requests the board approve the following resolution resolve that the board approve awarding 19 million three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in bond volume one million twenty nine thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars in annual litec and 500,000 in affordable housing and community development fund funding to Sweet Galilee at Wigwam LLC for Sweet Galilee at the Wigwam according to the terms of the 2018 AB application round as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us. Uh, entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And please welcome Alan Murkowski to discuss a recommendation regarding the bond volume 4% credits, a safe haven veterans apartment. Good morning. Thank you. Again, I'm Alan Murkowski, the rental housing tax credit manager at IHCDA. And here to present our third bond recommendation of the day. Uh, this is a development that came in to us in 2018. It came in in the 2018 bond volume round. It came in last November. It has a total development cost proposed of 13.289 million <coughs> with 11.5 million of bond volume being rec uh, requested and 404,471 annually in uh, tax credits. It also has a $7.9 million request uh, to community development block grant disaster recovery funding and it's proposing to create 75 units of affordable housing. A safe haven foundation is proposing a new construction of a three-story common corridor building with 75 one-bedroom units to address the needs of homeless veterans in Lake County. So that's what's unique about this project. It's, it's really focusing on addressing that need, uh, including uh, <laughs> community supportive services. The project will have a community room, uh, supportive service space, and they're also requesting an allocation of 75 project-based Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing, or VASH for short, vouchers. That presentation will be followed by mine uh, for those vouchers. So it has uh, the, the, the uh, operating subsidy uh, in place to help be able to assist veterans to move into this development and, and be able to live there uh, with affordable rent. The project is located near several amenities, including just a few miles away from the VA outpatient clinic um, in, in Hobart, uh, so that the veterans have easy access to that. The project uh, was reviewed by IGA real estate staff to ensure it met the criteria of the 2018-19 QAP. Additionally, on August 12th, the applicant and members of the development team came to IHCDA as, as they do for every bond deal prior to the board meeting. We make sure that they uh, have the opportunity to present the project to us, uh, including real estate staff and executive staff, to see if there are any final questions and to determine that uh, it is ready to come before you. So as far as key performance indicators on this, I want to note that IHCDA currently has 223 total uh, permit supportive housing units for veterans in our portfolio. That's prior to this funding. And 203 of those were funded with, with uh, low-income low income housing tax credits. Uh, so you can see this is a pretty sizable, this is a, a, a pretty uh, sizable addition to our portfolio as far as services, uh, housing units for, for veterans, and really a great opportunity to, uh, to add to that and make an impact in the part of the state where they've demonstrated a strong need. And we will continue to track reduction of veterans experiencing homelessness as we continue to add more units to our, to our portfolio. So the recommendation we have is for the bond volume amount 11.5 million, 404,471 in tax credits and a 7.9 million CDBG DR funding to safe haven uh, veterans apartments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Have we ever done any projections on how many units really would be needed to fill the need to take care of all of our homeless veterans? Um, specifically for homeless? We haven't seen, uh, not, not to my knowledge, we haven't seen a lot of developments come to us specifically targeting mm -hmm. uh, that population. You know, as, part as, as far as looking at the number of units, you know, we rely on um, data related to the market study, but also with, with those on the service team. Also, I, I believe that, you know, looking at coordinated entry data to make sure that there is that need for, for 
uh, that population. So I think it's a combination of working with the service providers prior to submitting the application and once we have the application to ensure that the market study is validating um, the need for that many units. And then veterans in general. Right, so I, that, that is, you know, veteran, uh, as far as tracking homeless veterans, that's part of um, uh, what we collect in our point in time count each year. So we have uh, a good indication for how many veterans are homeless in Indiana, where they are. Uh, and I believe that's gonna be part of a presentation later today in the point in time update. But uh, yeah, we do track that to ensure that uh, that the housing is, is not, it's, it's, there, there is a need for it, and it's in areas of the state where we have data to help support that, that the need is there. Any questions? Alan, really neat project. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the CDBG disaster recovery funds? I know that IG was initially awarded that funding in probably in 2008, 2009. So talk us through, is this, is this from that original allocation? Is this program income? And then maybe the size of that award maybe seems larger than we've historically done with CDBG. Sure. D. Yeah, it's it's part of the original allocation. Uh, so you're right, Mark. We had the allocations come to us in 2008, 2009. We had two tranches of CDBG disaster recovery funding, and I believe between the two is about 102 million that we received. And and so we uh, were able to allocate um, all of that with, with it, except for this remaining 7.9. Million. Um, so once we recognized that that we still had this funding, we worked with HUD. HUD wanted us to allocate this funding to ensure that that it could be used in Indiana. So we worked with them to identify uh, one project that was a, a high priority of IHCDAs to to allocate this funding to uh, to be able to um, ensure again that it's it's utilized in Indiana. Uh, it was a project also that um, we I think we, we specifically. Uh, in, worked with HUD to say this is a project we think that could definitely utilize and, and benefit from this. Using, uh, and part of that was using data to show that uh, Lake County was severely impacted by the 2008-2009 floods, uh, but then as far as the total percentage of funding that had gone to Lake County was a very small percentage of the total, I think it was like 6.3%, mm. which made the case that this is a special priority, a special needs project. Uh, it would be a way for us to allocate the remaining amount of CD CDBGD's disaster funding uh, and, and also be able to use it in conjunction with our with our VASH vouchers. Uh, we, uh, I, I won't speak too much on those, Zach's gonna get into this next, but we issued an RFP uh, when we received 75 VASH vouchers from HUD. Um, this project responded to that and met the criteria, so we thought this is a great opportunity to, to use those VASH vouchers and also use the remaining amount of our CDBG disaster funding. As far as the amount, we, we made sure that this was I think ideally, ideally we want to use it in one project to ensure that it got, got allocated. And by structuring it as a loan, you know, we do anticipate uh, we will get this funding back over time. Uh, but we made sure that the amount that we're putting into it was uh, that there was a, the need for it. So uh, we, as part of our underwriting, the part of the reason that this, this project took a while is to ensure that all the, all the parts were in place, all the financing was in place, that this fit within that. <clears throat> so um, that's a little background on how this, how this came about. And again, I think a good solution to ensure that the, the last of our disaster recovery funding goes to a, uh, a high priority project that in and part of the state where there really uh, it was impacted by the floods. Thank you. Any additional questions? Alan, I believe we're ready for your resolution. Okay. Staff respectfully requests the board approve the following resolution. Uh, resolve that the board approve awarding 11,500,000 in bond volume. Uh, 404,471 in annual tax credits and 7.9 million in CDBG DR funding to a Safe Haven Veterans Apartments LP for a Safe Haven Veterans Apartments according to the terms of the 2018 AB application round as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Alan. All right, thank you. And please welcome Zach Gross to discuss a recommendation regarding VASH, Project-Based Voucher Award, a Safe Haven Veterans Apartments. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so as Alan said, I'm Zach Gross, I'm the Supportive Housing Manager, and I'm going to re here to request approval for the operating subsidy on a Safe Haven uh, Veterans Apartments. So the Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Program um, allows public housing agencies to uh, combine uh, rental assistance um, with supportive services offered by the VA. Um, the goal of this program is to increase the supply of current supportive housing units for homeless veterans. And project basing these units allows um, homeless veterans to have easier access to apartments by shortening the wait time and the time it takes to search and find units, which is a big barrier. 
In 2017, IHDA was awarded a special allocation of 75 batch vouchers, um, specifically to be project-based in a development in northwestern Indiana. Um, following an RFP uh, selection process, a Safe Haven Veterans Apartments was conditionally selected um, under that RFP for the award of those vouchers. So we're recommending the award of 75 uh, one bedroom, 75 vouchers for one bedroom apartments um, at the total amount of $792,000 for the initial uh, year one of gross annual rent. And the key performance indicators for this will be utilization of vouchers awarded um, to the project, total number of chronically homeless veterans served by those vouchers, and compliance throughout the period of the contract. So we recommend that the board approve the award of 75 vouch project-based vouchers to Safe Haven Veterans Apartments LP um, for the, these apartments in Lake County, Indiana for a period of 15 years based on 117% of the annual fair market rent. Do we have any questions for Zach? Just a comment, maybe Zach and then Jake and the team, just it's neat how you're wrapping multiple layers of ICA kind of buckets that you've got around this particular project to make it work. I, I mean, I think that's a neat use of got your, the 4% credit, the disaster re recovery. Um, I think you've got some, the VASH vouchers on the project, um, annual LIHTC. I mean, so it's just neat that you're using different tools to stand up this project, which I'm sure is, um, sounds like it's been a long road coming mm -hmm. for, for a population that certainly needs um, safe and affordable housing. So that's really neat, kudos. And, and just a um, kind of a bit of trivia for the board, Indiana per capita has sent more men and women to defend our country than any other state in the union. Wow. So, and, and someone shared with me that we have our largest concentration of veterans up in Northwest Indiana. I like, we're getting some nods, so um, thank you all for your leadership in this. Any additional questions, comments? Zach, I think we're ready for your resolution. <coughs> Staff respectfully requests the board approve the following resolution. Resolved that the board approve an award of 75 VASH project-based vouchers to a Safe Haven Veterans Apartments LP for a period of 15 years based on 117% of the annual fair market rents for Lake County as recommended by staff. We have a resolution before us. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. And please welcome Chris Nevels to discuss a recommendation regarding modular workforce housing pilot program final selection. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Chris Nevels. I'm the home and CDBG manager. Um, as some of you may recall, I was here back in April uh, presenting some general information on this program. Uh, the point of that presentation was time, kind of to give a general overview of the program and also to get permission to move forward with the release of the RFQ, which we have done. Uh, today I'm here because we've made our final selections for that RFQ and we just want to um, inform the board and get approval to move forward with making those awards. Um, so to provide a quick background of the, of the program again, just to refresh everyone, um, the Modular Workforce Housing Pilot Program, uh, unfortunately between April and now we didn't come up with an easier title to say. <laughs> Uh, but it is a program that proposes to incentivize partnerships between not-for-profit organizations, local units of government, and modular housing manufacturers. Um, through this partnership, the idea is to take pre-existing blight elimination program lots uh, in communities with economic and demographic indicators uh, that show a strong need for workforce housing, and then use those lots for the construction of single-family modular housing. Uh, so these homes that are constructed will be, then be marketed to homeowners making at 140% AMI or less uh, for that county. And the participating not-for-profits will be able to uh, retain the proceeds that they make from these home sales to use for a, um, what we're calling a revolving housing fund. And that's money that they can earmark to be used for additional single-family affordable housing going forward. To talk a little bit about the process, on April 25th, 2019, as I said, we came to the uh, IECDA board and received approval to move forward with the RFQ. And then on April 29th, we uh, released the RFQ to the public um, with the intention of selecting up to two teams uh, with an award of $500,000 for each team. So the teams were meant to be composed of, at a minimum, a not-for-profit applicant, a representative of the local unit of government or the BEP partner that worked with the local unit of government, um, a uh, a modular housing manufacturer or installer, and a licensed realtor 
or an individual who had an extensive knowledge of the real estate market in the area that they were planning on, on building the homes. So respondents were limited to communities that had five or more BEP lots in them because we want, really wanted to focus on kind of having a concentration of these units to really make a, make a change that could be seen in the community um, through this project. Um, a list of this, these communities was provided in the RFQ and then we also had a really uh, a cool interactive map that we put together that was given out to the, all, all the uh, respondents so they could, they could actually like zoom in to the block level and see where every single BEP lot was. Um, so responses were due on or before June 24th, uh, 2019. On May 12th, we uh, conducted a webinar for all the interested applicants to provide technical assistance and then slides from that webinar were provided to people uh, upon request if they couldn't make it to the actual webinar. Uh, during the entire application period, we also maintained an FAQ document uh, so that uh, applicants would have easy access to questions that were frequently being directed to us about the RFQ. Uh, in total, we received 10 responses. Only responses that were received before the deadline of 5 p.m. on June 24th were considered. Um, each qualifying response was reviewed by the review committee to make sure that they met all the requirements that were set out in the RFQ. Uh, responses were checked for completeness and that they met all our threshold requirements. And any responses that failed to meet those threshold requirements, you know, naturally were not considered uh, for funding. So the selected respondents will each <coughs> receive $500,000 as a grant. Uh, this program is going to be funded using interest payments on the uh, TCAP loan payments or tax credit assistance program loan payments. After being selected, the teams will be required to identify all the potential home buyers for the program. They'll also be required to complete and submit an IHCDA home buyer uh, application and uh, pro forma, and those things have all been tailored to kind of, you know, they were originally for the home program, we've tailored them a little bit to, to fit more with this since there's a, a few less requirements and things. And then uh, also they will be required to pass all our threshold and underwriting requirements um, as usual. We will continue to request regular updates from them on the progress they've made on the project, and we also, of course, will be available to provide technical assistance if they request any. So we are going to be tracking three key performance indicators for this program. First, we will be tracking the number and locations of all the units that are created, as well as the total dollar amounts that, that is recycled through the revolving housing fund. Second, we'll be uh, tracking data related to the efficiency of modular housing as a method of affordable housing. And that'll include tracking things like the length of construction, project costs, and uh, any delays or difficulties that the, the um, participants encounter. And then finally, we will be checking the program design and implementation lessons and experiences from both the applicants. Since this is a pilot program, we wanted to really get a deep dive into what they experienced going through this so that we can really identify best practices moving forward uh, with this program. So uh, as I mentioned, we did receive 10 responses and we are recommending two to be funded, which you can see in table A here. The first group that we are uh, recommending for funding is the Affordable Housing and Community Development Corporation. They are based out of Marion, Indiana, and their proposed project location is also in Marion, Indiana. They are proposing to build six homes uh, using the full $500,000. They have uh, a couple of members of the local unit of government on their team. They have the mayor, the building commissioner, and the city planning director are all partners with the program. Uh, their modular housing representative is Elite Home Builders, which is based out of Marion, Indiana. And then they have a realtor, uh, Janet Barnett from Remax Realty on their team. The second group that we are recommending for funding is La Casa Inc., based out of Goshen. And their proposed project location is in Elkhart, Indiana, where they are proposing to build three homes, uh, again, using the full $500,000. On their team, they have the Director of Community and Economic Development for the city of Elkhart. They are also working with Next Modular Homes, which is based out of Goshen, Indiana, and Heckman Homes, which is based out of Napanee, Indiana. And then their realtor is, uh, will be Mark and Jennifer Kern from Kern Realty. So staff is recommending the approval of the award of funds as set forth in this table to both of these two finalists. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions anyone has before moving forward. This is a pilot project. Correct. So what are you looking for in order to expand this? Because you had more people express interest in participating than we actually are awarding. Right. So I think there are a number of data points that we're looking at and, and there were three or a couple of main focuses of the program. One was to kind of see how modular housing works on sort of a larger scale. We've had, we've had applicants for different programs use modular housing in the past, but you know, those were kind of one-off 
projects, we wanted to really see, you know, if we focused on modular housing, how that works. So that's one of our key performance indicators is to track this because, you know, if it, if it shows that this, this went really well, it was cheaper, it was quicker, it was more efficient, then that's definitely something that both we can point to that data as proof that this is a, a method that works and it's information that we can use moving forward to, you know, expand this program to maybe even more emphasize the modular housing aspect of it or possibly implement modular housing incentives in other programs as well going forward. So I think that's one thing we're definitely going to be looking at. Um, I think another thing would be watching how the revolving housing fund is used uh, to see you know, how well groups are able to utilize that. Uh, you know, as this is a pilot program, you know, we don't really have experience with how, how far this money is going to go. So it's kind of, it'll be interesting to see exactly what the groups are able to do with that. And then, you know, so that'll give us an idea on how effective, you know, a revolving housing fund is as a, as a concept for other programs that could implement it as well. And then in general, uh, between these two groups, they, they are both, they're, one of the reasons they were selected is that they, they are approaching this program in, in kind of different ways. So as an example, uh, Affordable Housing and Community Development Corporation is allowing the homeowners to select their own modular housing plans. So they're going to be involved in the process of identifying lots and also identifying you know, how their modular home is going to be designed. You know, obviously, they will be informed about the budget and what their budget constraints are, but they're going to have a bit more of an impact in how the homes are designed. Whereas La Casa is, kind of has some set designs already picked out that they're going to be using. So I think these are, we kind of were, were hoping to get different approaches to this program, which kind of goes to our, our KPI number three of uh, best practices to see, you know, I, I think we're, we're confident that both of these will, will work well, but, you know, this will kind of allow us to see which methods work the best and then kind of implement those if we keep the program going moving forward. Thank you. Any questions? Chris? Talk to us, as I read the memo, almost like a narrative, it's, it's fantastic you got 10, and then we kind of jump to the end of the story that you've picked two. It was kind of hard for me to pull out from the memo, like what, what went into that process? What were the criteria to go from the 10 to the two? Sure. Um, yeah, just can you speak to that a little bit, how, sure. you, how you narrowed that down? Because to Lieutenant Governor's point, there was a lot of interest in this program. Right, um, and that was actually, that was, that was very encouraging to see that many people apply That's for really it. That's really exciting. Um, yeah. So it, it was a lot like uh, you know many of our RFQs. There were a number of narratives that had to be submitted. So each applicant had to discuss their experience. Each applicant had to discuss what their program design would be. Um, they had to discuss what sort of partnerships they had established with other groups in the area. Um, one thing we looked at was a number of workforce housing data indicators. Uh, so we had 12 factors that we looked at, and each region was scored on that level of 12 of what factors they met. So you know, a region that scored a one was the, was had the worst score. Twelve was the best score, and those were looking at things like unemployment rates. Um, I have them written down here. Unemployment rates, job growth. These are just a couple of them. The net commuting to county number, and for example, the gross flow of earnings. So counties where people were working in that county, they were earning money, and then they were taking that money and spending it in another county. Uh, that was some of the factors that we would look at. And so, um, as a group, we met. Uh, the review committee met and um, just kind of went through each application, discussing the strengths and weaknesses, uh, comparing those workforce indicators, um, taking a look at you know, uh, counseling. So housing counseling is required to be provided by all these groups. And for an example, both of these groups are HUD certified housing counselors. So they'll be providing that housing counseling themselves in house. Um, another example is that La Casa has experience doing modular housing. They're actually working on a modular housing project that was funded through HOME right now. Um, and the Affordable Housing Corporation has kind of a, a workforce development program in that county already existing called Grants Got Talent that they're going to kind of combine with this program to do joint marketing and, and it's, there's a lot of synergy between those two groups. So uh, it, it was overall just an examination of the narratives that they provided uh, as well as um, kind of taking a look at the, the environment where they were proposing their project and uh, what we thought would be a good fit for the area mix of qualitative and quantitative it sounds like yes okay will you be debriefing with the the other eight who are not being recommended um, I think if we are more than willing to do that if they if they are interested in having that conversation with us you know we've got all our notes and everything so it's definitely and then and and to be clear there were definitely a number of very good 
applicants, it was a difficult decision to narrow it down to two. And I think we'd be more than willing to, to debrief with those groups and discuss, you know, how, how our decision process went. Any additional comments, questions? Chris, I believe we're ready for your resolution. Okay. So, uh, staff respectfully requests the board approve the following resolution. Resolve that the board approve funding in the form of grants using TCAP loan repayments in an aggregate amount not to exceed $1 million to the respondents as set forth in Table A as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. <coughs> Excuse me. All second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. And please welcome Rich Harcourt and Kim Harris to discuss the exploration of loan servicing solutions. Good morning, board. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have with me as part of my team, Kim Harris, who runs our home ownership department, and Tom Pearson, uh, who is kind of his lieutenant, who has done a lot of the heavy lifting on this project. Uh, today we're here just to request your permission to go to market with an RFP to look uh, at a servicing provider. So uh, no real hard decisions to be made other than we'd, we'd just like your approval to go into the market, see what a servicing provider can do for us. So we're going to be kind of quick and brief as we go through this, but let me talk just a little bit about uh, the business. Recall that uh, a big part of what we do at the uh, IHCDA is help qualified first-time homeowners and some second-time homeowners uh, achieve housing by providing uh, below-cost uh, interest rates, mortgages, along with down payment assistance. And when we make those loans, uh, uh, we fund them in one of two ways. One of them, primarily first-time home buyers, we put in a bond indenture that we hold on our balance sheet. The, the, for the most part, the second-time homeowners, those loans get sold into a secondary market. But in either instance, we have to have those loans servicing, serviced. So uh, in our case, we've had a long-time service provider, U.S. Bank, and a number of its prior entities have serviced those loans for us, and they buy those mortgaging servicing rights from us. They provide servicing for the, uh, for the loans. Uh, we have used the same vendor for a, a long period of time, and there's some real pros and cons to doing that, but we think it's time to step into the marketplace and, and um, begin to um, uh, see what other servicing options are provided for us and what we can do. So uh, just a real quick recap, uh, you know, the bond volume, the loans in 18 that we made that we hold on our balance sheet, we did $187 million. Loans that we sold, we did $252 million, uh, and all those, again, serviced by U.S. banks. So servicing is a, is a big part of what we do and a, uh, an important part of what we do. When, when a customer, uh, one of our clients, gets a loan through us, they expect the loan to be properly serviced, and it reflects on us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Harris, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the other highlights with this. Thank you. Uh, again, Kim Harrison, Homeownership Director. Servicing basically is like we all know if you all have a mortgage, right? We all have mortgages. So we're going to make our payments to somebody, don't we? And that particular person is the one that services the loan. They're the one that takes the principal interest, taxes, and insurance and splits it apart. HFA has two choices. One, you serve it yourself. Two, you farm it out. So for the past 22 years, we've elected to kind of farm it out. There's a lot, of, a lot to be had with that because you don't have the risk involved if you farm it out. U.S. Bank is sort of that capacity. So what we're looking basically is to make sure we find the right servicer that can give us the ability to look at different alternatives that maybe we don't have now with U.S. Bank. Nothing wrong with U.S. Bank. We're just saying, are we sure we have the best provider for us to maybe advance our services, advance our programs, and so forth? It's also important to realize that servicing is a direct reflection on you. So if you don't service correctly and the borrowers aren't happy with making their payments, they won't get a loan through Indiana Housing again. So we have to make sure customer service is there as well. Um, you want to talk about the landscape? Yeah. So I just want to talk for a little bit about some of the critical things when you think about a servicer. And first of all, it's a high-risk business. Servicing loans uh, in, encompasses a lot of risk. Um, there are uh, uh, There's operations risk. There's getting the payments in. There's setting up the escrows. There's making sure the insurance, the taxes get paid. And every mortgage is different. Every mortgage has got its its subtlety, so there's a lot of operating risk. There's a lot of regulatory risk. It gets uh, a lot of regulation tied around how you service, your parameters, your timing, what you can and can't do. 
there's mark to market risk, right? These folks buy mortgaging servicing rights from us and they buy those servicing rights tied to how quickly they think the loan is going to pay off. But if the loan pays off much sooner, rates come down, the loan refinances, that mortgage servicing right disappears and they lose money. So they've got, they've got an economic mark to market uh, component that at least uh, for profit um, entities have to, to recognize and show. And then lastly, there's, there's losses involved in this business. So, you know, every loan that we, uh, we make has got either a Jenny, a Freddie, or a Fannie guarantee behind it. So when the loan goes bad, the expectation is right that Jenny, Freddie, or Fannie reimburse uh, uh, the servicer for those loans. But that isn't the way it happens. The loan goes bad. The servicer has to buy that loan back. They take it through foreclosure. They... Uh, they end up, you know, with legal fees, with cost of capital, those sorts of things. And then when they finally have a, a loss, uh, recognize that loan, they take it to Jenny, Freddie, or Fannie, and very rarely do they get 100% payment. There's so much regulatory burden around what you have to do to collect the loan that, that you know, they collect 96, 97% of the loan, not 100%. So there's some real operating loss in it. So I, I share all that with you in that who the servicer is is important. It's not only a reflection of representing our clients and making sure that people that have a loan with us get good service, but also that down the road when there's collections risk, when there's operating risk, that they're in business to continue to, to maintain and do that servicing. So Kim's going to talk about why we're going to solicit an RFP. Well, again, as I said, we're going to do it so we can find out do we have the best servicer for what we want to do? Can we provide other, other products to our clients? And can U.S. Bank help us with that? If not, it's time we find someone that can help me produce new products for these clients. And that's kind of the project core is to make sure that we look at different alternatives. Um, just an example, um, a, a master servicers are typically called will limit sometimes what our credit score can be. Uh, not that, don't misunderstand, I'm not a subprime lender, I will not do subprime products, but they do limit what your credit score limits could be, like a 650. They also will put different um, limits on the lender. You have to have so much in net worth before they let you go. So there's these kind of restraints that we're kind of looking to see if we can expand our resources. You want to talk about Frost and Sullivan, Kim? Yeah, we can do that. Frost Oops, and too far. There we go. We engage Frost and Sullivan regularly to kind of give us an idea as a, as a consultant. What could we do um, to, to look at different servicing pro providers and so forth? So they really provided uh, four options for us to look at. Um, you know, direct service. It service your own. Um, Subservice means you basically do the pooling yourself, but then you have somebody service loan after that, of course. And subservice all of it, of course, and then buy your own, buy an actual existing platform. As we see mortgage companies kind of combining together, they don't need two servicing platforms. So if they're an opportunity to buy one is actually out there as well. So we'll take their, um, their analysis and look into it as we proceed. Um, we're op our options right now are basically look at the servicers that currently provide the service we have now. It's like U.S. Bank, as I mentioned, Lakeview and Dover Mule. Those are all ob obviously servicers that do 100% servicing and are called master servicers. On the other end of the perspective, believe it or not, we have fellow HFAs that also do servicing, and they will service other HFAs. So we have the ability to look at those items, look, look at those individuals, because they are HFAs in their own right, and they do have existing servicing platforms. You can see Idaho, Pennsylvania, and Alabama, just a few that do that. We also could take that on way down the road if we decided to go that direction. Another thing we looked at, uh, which is really, really interesting, is a company called Black Knight. Black Knight is the Cadillac of, of servicing platform providers, and we have been, been discussing with them of what it would take if we did go down the road of actually putting together a servicing platform to service our own. So we're lucky to find a vendor that's willing to basically talk to us from the square one all the way through if we wanted to go that route. Questions, concerns, thoughts? Yes, sir. Kim, uh, what's our current cost with U.S. Bank, roughly? Well, we don't pay U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank pays us. Okay. How so much? what happens is they actually provide us a fee based upon the loan. Okay. So it depends on the interest rate, and the interest rate then will depend upon what service and release fee they give me. Give me an example. Uh, 1.43 on, 1 on FHA. That's probably the biggest one that we get. And you said you we're going to test the market to look for new alternatives being sought out. You mentioned new products. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 
I don't understand. What do you mean by new products that, products that we, we can offer our yeah, clients? Or products that we don't have currently available, and sometimes U.S. Bank are, will limit what we can do. So we look for an opportunity for other um, servicers that may let us be more creative in what we offer. Anything we offer is going to be conforming, Fannie, Freddie, Jenny related. So pro products, what do you mean by products? Uh, mortgage products okay. that we provide to our, to our participating lenders. Well, mortgage products, you mean? Uh, Deeper DPAs, down payment assistance, lower credit scores, a 660 instead of 650. Uh, looking at, looking at uh, lenders that actually have less than a $2 million net worth. Okay. Those types of things. Have we had this conversation with US? I assume? Yeah, I have. For the past 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I have. Okay. And, and We've currently. We've been real transparent with them. And they, they, yeah, know, they, know. We're, we're, they know we're going to market. Yeah. We, there's no secrets here. Okay. And I have made it clear. I, I, in fact, I'll be honest. I actually have, have in process right now the workings to get our credit score reduced down to 650. And so we'll see what that works out. And 650 seems to be the sweet spot right now in terms of delinquency. Am I in no way want to do bad loans? No. It's not my mission. <laughs> but the mission is also not to, to, to actually take advantage of the market, too, not miss business. I should mention Rich and I went to U.S. Bank last week in, in, the, in Minneapolis and met with uh, the executives there and had the conversation and let them gave, – gave, we've been giving them the heads up. We've been exploring this now for about a year with the Frost and Sullivan report that we got, which kind of helped us formulate the RFP. And then we met with uh, the mortgage uh, team uh, last week um, just to get a sense as to their commitment to F HF or, uh, HFAs. Uh, who they're servicing because they service multiple HFAs. Mm -hmm. And U.S. Bank doesn't have a presence in Indiana other nope. than four branches, which is a little unique. Yep. Um, That's good. So, um, yes, yeah, so we have had those, continue to have those conversations. And, yeah. The intriguing part, excuse me, were you done? No. The intriguing part is are, are other um, governmental, quasi-governmental, get, get this right, uh, entities, you mentioned Idaho, others mm -hmm. might be considered. Yes, and so you're obviously benchmarked nationally. Um, how many other, let's, since we're a quasi-state organization, that'd be 50, how many of them um, outsource to other quasi-governmental entities versus mm. an independent bank? Mm. The 16 entities that they currently accept services. Uh, of, of, of the states? states. Of the states. Okay. Eight. So it's a substantial number. Okay. And, and some of the state HFAs that are currently doing that cannot take in any more state HFAs. They're at capacity. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, ha we're having those conversations with we had some We're not blazing a trail. There's benchmarks out there. Oh, no. No, yeah. no. In fact, you know, one of the reasons to do this, and I don't want to get too deep in the woods, but U.S. Bank is the last U.S. national banking organization servicing FHA loans for third parties. A lot of banks in the last downturn took a step back from that business. So. You know, we have a little bit of concern about, as Jake said, their commitment to the business, and we spend a lot of time with our senior management and feel pretty good about it, but it's, it just feels like it's the right time to understand the, the market a little bit better. And I think the last time we did this was 22 years ago. So, years, that's yeah. right. so it's good to go through this process. It's a, it's a good process for us. Mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to mention real quick the loan servicing committee that we have, we established about a year ago, and I know Mark and – uh, the team was on that. Yeah, sure, I, I can mention it. So there is actually a committee that's been put together on this, so this isn't something that staff is just bringing to us uh, under the cloud of secrecy and uh, bringing it out. So we have had a micro group that's been working on that, and we have talked about it. And, you know, I look at you know, three big points that I just wrote down that I think is necessary. Uh, number one, I think the attention to this is great, so I appreciate you guys asking the questions as well. Because I think it's one of those things that sometimes comes across as very boring and mundane, but as they were talking about, it's very important. And so it's something that if we want to keep the programs going and operating profitably, then it's something that we have to pay attention to. And anytime you have something that's very important operationally, I think it's imperative that you have good market understanding. And so as we move to the second point, you know, you do have a crisis, what, I mean, 10 years ago, that was obviously very impactful for the marketplace and directly related to mortgages. So we need to make sure we have our eye there. You have the fact that U.S. Bank is the last U.S. bank 
to say that uh, that's involved in this. So now you got a, a very limited pool of people who are actually working on this, which then means, you know, to me, you need to start thinking about, okay, what happens if they decide they don't want to be part of that? What happens if they start making their guidelines so strict that we can't operate our program the way we want to? And then, which then leads me into my third point, I guess, since it is very important, since it is a market that's changed drastically and some of the players have dwindled, you have a risk mitigation portion that you need to be focused in on. What happens, again, back to if something, if U.S. Bank exits or creates problems. And then, but you also have a strategic part that you need to be thinking about. You need to start be thinking not just what's going to happen in the next year or two, but what's going to happen three, five, seven, or ten years. And so you need some, I think, not only market sounding, but you also need to understand what your choices are and where IACA wants to head out. And I think an RFP is a great way to do that because you're going to get responses back and you're going to be able to say, where is U.S. Bank now? Where are we currently? What's our risk that we need to be able to mitigate in the future? And, of course, strategically, do we have an opportunity where we can enhance this program for fellow Hoosiers? So I think this is a great way to do it. This is not committing IHCDA in any way, shape, or form to the responses that come back. So the board will not be handcuffed, if you will, by an RFP response coming back and us having no choice but to accept a recommendation. This will be something that can be discussed uh, at, you know, within the committee and also at the board level to determine what the right course of action is. So I think it's a great way to see what's out there in the marketplace so we can make the right decision. And I, I ask the questions I ask only because we're on television. I'd read everything. I knew staff had done their due diligence. U.S. Bank is, is – June can attest to this because she's a banker, but it's one of the top in the country. But we have these risks looking at us. So I commend staff for being ahead of the curve. And, you know, if they're, they're making it harder and harder to get loans. And I also ask the questions because this is how my wife and I were able to buy our first house when mm. interest rates were 18% mm. in 1983. Good. So that's a first time home Good. buyer. So I've seen the benefit in another crisis, different from the last crisis we had, the crisis when. We had the most ridiculous interest rates in anyone's lifetime in this room. So, yeah, it's a good program. I just asked the questions. As a freshman, I shouldn't be asking, but those are the reasons why I knew you were involved. Great so, questions. and I'd read everything. Well done. June's a banker, so I should let her talk. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing very well. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so. Any additional questions, comments? Just piggyback on what Mark said. I'm not. We're not. Treasurer's not on the loan servicing committee, but I think we know, regardless of our business, we've all. We know the challenges that come with potentially changing a legacy system, a 20 to 25 year old operational system. I think any of us at this table, again, regardless of your business, have, can probably feel that pain. And so, if we can support, from any perspective, um, just let I think us as a board member know how we might support the process, whether a change is made or not. It's a fantastic exercise. I think it's probably been. Uh, very deliberative process, very thoughtful process, and so um, you know, if there's again, if there's ways we can support um, this this process, let us know. Any additional comments? Great discussion. I think we're probably ready for a resolution. Yeah, thank you for your comments and and uh, your offer of help. Um, Staff respectfully request the board approve the following resolution: Resolve that the board approve IHCDA's home ownership department. To initiate the process described herein to review and evaluate the best solutions for servicing its single family mortgage loans as recommended by staff. Board, we have a resolution before us. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please welcome Elspeth O'Neill to provide an update regarding the community services point in time count update. You got your Boilermaker colors on. <laughs> I, I am from West Lafayette. <laughs> I didn't go to Purdue, though. <laughs> Could have fooled me. Oh, well, you know what? I'll just say Boiler up then. <laughs> um, I am Elspeth Hilton. I am the Director of Community Services at IHCDA. Um, I will take just about five minutes of your time to do an update about my division and the point in time count. So um, I will try not to talk too fast. I know you guys can receive these slides ahead of time. Um, so the Community Services Division, our division oversees funding and resources that prevent, help pre to prevent and end homelessness in Indiana. Um, with that, uh, we uh, really um, 
focus a lot of our time around the continuum of care funding, and that's a program through HUD uh, that focuses on housing individuals who are um, experiencing homelessness, and, as well as optimizing programs and self-sufficiency for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, as part of that, there are uh, continuums of care across the nation uh, that have different service areas depending on that state or the county that they oversee, uh, what that service area entails. So our role um, with the Community Services Division is to uh, uh, help the COC board uh, implement their policies and procedures and their funding uh, throughout the state of Indiana. In Indiana, there's two COCs, two continuum of, ten continuums of care, and uh, one encompasses Marion County, and then there's the balance of state, which is the remaining 91 counties. So our role at IHCDA is to support that balance of state continuum of care, lots of counties to cover. Um, in the Community Services Division specifically, we are what's called the collaborative applicant. Um, we also are the HMIS lead, and we oversee the pit and hit count every single year. So I'll go over those briefly, and I know that there were some questions about the pit count specifically, so I'll spend a little bit more time there. But um, the HMIS stands for the Homeless Management Information System, and what that means is that any uh, organization that receives our federal dollars in the Community Services Division, they are required to put their client level data into the HMIS system. So it tracks individuals who are experiencing homelessness, where they're at currently, where they end up, that kind of thing, what kind of funding we, we work with them. With them. Um, it, we then compile that information and, and give it to, to HUD in several reports throughout the year. Um, currently, there are about 650 individuals who access the HMIS uh, system and over 150 agencies who work within it. Um, as I mentioned at the top, we uh, give out several sources of funding to organizations to help prevent and end homelessness. The one I will mention specifically here is the continuum of care funding. So that helps with rental assistance and supportive services for individuals receiving, uh, experiencing homelessness. So um, it could be a short period of time, long period of time, depending on the type of funding that they are receiving. Um, with COC, there are 67 projects throughout the balance of state. We support 26 of those, specifically at IHDDA. We may provide technical assistance to the remaining projects. So we do some, uh, work with all of the individual organizations who receive this type of funding. Um, we found over the last program year that uh, the IHDDA portfolio encompassed 76% of the total assisted units within the balance of state. Um, and on top of that, uh, the, the data that we found with a, within the last full program year was that households who entered into the HMIS system on average experienced 12 fewer days of homelessness when moved into COC-funded permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing units. Okay, so now we're at the point in time count. <laughs> um, uh, the point in time count is, is a nationwide count of sheltered and unsheltered um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So if you are a COC funded through HUD, you are required to do a point in time count at some point at the end of January every single year. You could think of this as sort of like a census of individuals experiencing homelessness. We find it's the best um, uh, uh, mechanism that we have right now to count how many individuals experiencing homelessness within our COC. Uh, for our team, we conducted the count uh, before I started here. So uh, that was January 23rd, and then we compile that information. So we get information from the regions. They have volunteers within their counties that they, they are counting individuals who are sheltered or unsheltered. They then take that information, compile it by a region, and then we compile it for the balance of state. Um, and so I have some quick results here that we can go over. Um, I know we're over time, so I'll just kind of do the high level things. Um, so if we're looking at the balance of state, so that's all counties but Marion, we found that the total count was 3,904 individuals who were both sheltered and unsheltered. So that's a 9% increase from, last, from 2018 to 2019. If you look at the statewide data, so we always encompass Marion County as well, there was an actual 4% increase. So 5,471 individuals were counted um, this year. We also look at special populations um, uh, when we take this data, so we get some demographic in information for individuals and compile it into special populations. There was a question about the veterans, and you can see here that this year we had a 16% increase in the number of veterans counted in the point in time count. Um, the other increase that I like to note is the families experiencing homelessness. That was also a 16% increase. 
Um, I noted here just some statewide data. Uh, we didn't have the comparison from last year to this year, but um, there are a healthy number of individuals who are veterans experiencing homelessness across the state. So 618 persons were counted statewide who are uh, veterans experiencing homelessness. So my last slide here is just uh, data across the last nine years. A lot, uh, we take the increase very seriously in our division um, from last year to this year, but I like to note that if you see this trend from 2010 to, th to today, the line is fairly straight, right? We have some dips that go down, but then it and goes back up. But we like to talk about here, how it, um, you know, this is one day a year, it's a census. What we would like to do in the future is get a healthier view of what, uh, you know, the full picture of homelessness in Indiana beyond just one day um, in January. So I rushed through it. Questions? Questions. Yes, um, I'm chairing the census count, you mm -hmm. know, that we're doing, and that count dates April 1st. So how does this work? With that I mean how are we going if we're doing an official count in January and then our official count is April 1st does that can we use that January count that's an interesting question or I don't know if not then what what are we doing to be sure that we're counting everyone on that official census date because you know so much funding that Indiana gets depends upon how many Hoosiers we have living in the state and it helps decision makers make better decisions if they know who they are actually serving. And we currently have 6.6, .6, but projections are we could get to 7 million. Yeah. But, you know, we've got to be sure we're counting every single person. Certainly. So the date in January is set by HUD. They say it has to be within the last, I believe, two weeks of January. But we could coordinate, uh, you could coordinate with our division, and we could talk about the process that we go through regionally and then their countywide counts and, and talk about how maybe you could coordinate with those individuals to get the uh, correct census count. Okay. Is there value for doing it more than just once a year? I mean, I just, point in time, I get that, but it just seems like more data points might help refine that number. Yeah, we've talked about that on our team, that maybe we could have a summer count or a count every quarter or something like that and talk about what happens as trending-wise throughout the year. We also receive a lot of information through our HMIS system that we could use to say these individuals, they, while they just receive our funding, how does this compare to the point in time count? I just want to say thank you for your team. They've done a great job with the coordination and the training of the number of volunteers that go out in all 91 counties, all 92 counties, really. Um, but there's a lot of training that has to take place with that. I know I had the opportunity to go out this year and do the interviews and to be part of um, one of the, the teams. Um, and um, your team's doing a great job with that training and continuing to build capacity at the local level. And I think the numbers that you're seeing there are better reflective because of the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know it's probably still, someone argue that it's underrepresented of the homeless challenges that we have in our state, but I think the not-for-profits and the volunteers are doing a much better job today than they were just a few years ago, and they continue to get better, so thanks to your team, so. Thank you, yep. yeah, I appreciate that. It is somewhat amazing that in this day and age that the most effective way to count is wrangling a lot of volunteers and actually physically going out and going face-to-face yeah. -face and yeah, and there's a lot of coordination. One day in January, like that's yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, and the police departments, the law enforcement that's coordinated now as well is um, much better today than it was just a few years ago too. Yeah. Elspeth, welcome to IHCDA. Does this change at all? This little fluctuation up. Does this change <coughs> your strategies? How funding gets allocated? Remind us, like we've got the data, fantastic. We satisfied our obligation to HUD. How does this change? if at all, strategically, how you approach the next year? Yeah, so we use this data when we submit for competitive funding, okay. um, and it can affect our scoring with HUD. But it does, uh, to Jake's point, it does inform us for what kind of coordination we need to do and how we communicate what we've been doing with volunteers. Um, I think my strategy, personally, is that this is one, I want to communicate more, this is one day a year, and that really the true homeless population may be much larger than this. So um, what it informs for me is that we have a bigger hill to climb than we even think we do. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Any additional comments, questions? It's amazing that this is done nationally, too, on that day, right? I mean, the number of volunteers it must take to go out get this job done.
Good job. Thank you, Alfred. And now, our fearless leader, uh -oh. Jacob Seid, will provide us with his executive report. Okay, just a quick report update on our anchor or our um, workforce housing initiatives that we've had. We have right currently four right now. We just heard the modular housing, the anchor employer. Uh, we had uh, four proposals submitted to us, which was great. Um, we're anticipating getting those completely reviewed uh, and being able to provide a recommendation to the board next month. Um, the same with the um, West Calumet Workforce Housing Pilot that we have in East Chicago. We had three responses for that, and I know we're diligently working to get those reviewed, and our goal would be to get it to September, but if not, we will make sure that we make a, a solid decision and bring it when it's appropriate. But again, a goal would be to bring this to the board in September as well. Um, I want to mention real quick, uh, we were down here, Lieutenant Governor and I, uh, on August 2nd for a ribbon cutting with Volunteers of America for the Fresh Start program. It's one of three uh, Fresh Starts um, that are um, going to be open in the state of Indiana targeting um, uh, parents who have substance abuse um, disorders and uh, who are moms or, or pregnant. And I'm um, just really proud of the work that's going on. And we were here um, to open up the, the Evansville Fresh Start program on August 2nd. Um, the next one that we have is the one in Columbus. And I think we're looking at an opening um, before the end of the year. So um, just real quick, I want to thank the IHCDA team who participated uh, with another initiative that Lieutenant Governor has uh, really taken on, and that is promoting diversity in agriculture. Uh, at our state fair, and that was on August 14th. I know I had several people from IHCDA participate and volunteer to be part of that uh, event, and uh, we've only heard good things about it. So I'm just really proud of the team at IHCDA to be part of that event as well. So, and then um, if the board, if any board members are av available to stick around, I know we have Reverend Adrian Brooks and his uh, Memorial CDC have their annual luncheon immediately here. And, probably within the next half hour or so. So we <laughs> want to make sure we get, we're going to get there. So anyone likes to stick around, IEC has a table and board members are more than welcome to participate in that. Uh, I'll mention our next um, board meeting will be at in September at the Indiana Housing Conference and that'll be at the Marriott downtown. Uh, I'll be part of the housing conference, um, which was a partnership with the Indiana Affordable Housing Council, uh, the two day event um, there. So just a heads up on that one. So that's my update. Thank you. Any questions? Is there any further business to come before the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those nay, we stand adjourned. Thank you for it.